book of Colossians, chapter 4. As I said before, some time ago, my plan to preach to the book of Colossians was probably three months. But I think we've been with it for about a year and a half, almost two years. About a year and a half. If I had to preach the book again, I'll probably need two more years. I understand it so much better now. It's interesting, isn't it, when you start uh, working on a message, you've probably read the passage many, many times, and you think, well, now I'm ready. And you preach it, and then you start picking up on little details here and there. You say, oh, if I would have only known this, I would have <clears throat> had another different approach. Keeps on opening for me. And uh, uh, I'm so excited about the epistle that I'm going to be preaching, I think I'll be preaching from the parallel epistle of Ephesians next. I don't know. A lot of things similar to Colossians, but a few things that, we, that, that uh, I think as a church we need to understand. We're looking at chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 5 through 6. Let's read it together. <coughs> Chapter 4, verse 5 through 6. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Very simple, yes, isn't it? I have three points this afternoon. But before I should give you the points, for me, I, I, I was thinking about this this week in my kitchen. I made three um, kind of paintings, three things to decorate the kitchen. Pray, eat, and love. Pray, love, and eat, or something like that. I'm not sure the order. And as I was looking at this passage, I said, you know, if I had to do it again, I'd probably use these three uh, commands here. Pray, live, and guard. Pray for opportunities to share the gospel, verses 2 through 4. Pray that God will open doors. Pray that a guy will open mouths to proclaim the message clearly. Live your life in the light of the gospel, verse 5. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And then in verse 6, we need to guard our speech for the sake of the gospel. Let your conversation be always with grace, Paul says. Let your words be seasoned with truth and love. Be prepared to share the gospel with everyone at any time. Appreciate the verse, the song she chose this afternoon, Brother Tim. Um, it surely expresses everything I want to bring out tonight. Let's have a word of prayer as the Lord to bless, not just the message, but that it will help us understand that this is not just preaching. This is something that God inspired Paul to write. And it's come through the years all the way to uh, 2024 for us to consider and be ready to um, to do. You have me, Father, we we can read this in, in, in 10 seconds. We can probably make comments on it and be a spot on. Are we doing this? Are we, are we living this way? What you inspired Paul to write means to be living in a sacrificial way. As Brother Tim shared before, to spend ourselves for the cause of the message of salvation. And Lord, I pray that this afternoon you will help me be able to preach this message in the same spirit that Paul wrote it, with urgency. There's a need here. Paul was ready, no matter what his condition was, whether, whether it was in prison, he would still reach out to those um, uh, cellmates, to the prisoners, to the, to the soldiers, to whoever was around, he would look for the opportunity to reach out with the gospel. He would use the time wisely. So this afternoon as we consider these passages that we just read. May we take it to heart. May we take this seriously. And as we walk into this building, consider that we're walking into the mission field. This here, Lord, is kind of a safe space. 
This is our home. This is our family. But when we go out, we're in enemy territory. And we're called to fight the good fight. I pray that this message will help us understand that a little bit more. May the Spirit help us, whether in the preaching or the listening to the preaching, may we all take it to heart. In Jesus' name. I was reading an article this week, <clears throat> and it, it's one of those, and, and it had a question that kind of makes you sit back and say, ouch. And it said this, why is the gospel impact of today's Christianity making such a minimal impact in our society? I don't know about you, but if that's true, we're in trouble. Why is the gospel impact of today's Christianity making such a minimal impact in today's society. And so I was thinking about it, I said, you know, there's not really just one answer to that. If you look at society, you would see that uh, there's apathy in the society. People just care that they don't care. You talk to people about their condition of the soul and they're just going, oh, thank you very much, I can't be bothered with the message. If you're living here in Spain and you speak to Spanish people, you will see that there's a lot of skepticism. They've heard so much rubbish that when you bring the true message, they uh, can't trust it. There's skepticism. And then you come to a lot of people who have had a, a very difficult lives. And the hearts have been hardened. And they tend to blame, if God does exist, why then does he allow this and that? And so they've been blaming God for everything that man does. And they blame God for it. And then another reason I think is because we have so much information that we're not able to digest. And when we come with a message like the gospel, it's just, you know, much more information. We, the people can't be bothered with it. That's society around us. So with this question, I think it's not just a blame, uh, you know, to the church be blamed. I think there's a lot of things going on out there that just makes people just want to reject the message. And then considering the church, well, <clears throat> there's a tremendous lack of compassion for many Christians. We see somebody hurting, somebody whatever, it was, you know, we can't be bothered. We kind of see people like uh, in Mark chapter 8, I think it is, where a blind man was healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to perform twice, that he touched his eyes twice, in order for him to see clearly and far away. But the first time Jesus asked him, what do you see? He says, I see people as walking trees, just like silhouettes in shadow. He couldn't see them clearly. Then Jesus had to touch him again in order for him to see clear and far away. Sometimes we're like that first touch, we see people in shadow, we don't, we're just kind of careless, we don't have compassion for them. Or apathy in the pew, I have a book titled Apathy in the Pew. Sometimes we just come for you know, the one hour, hour and a half service and then let's get to the real thing and we get busy. Apathy in the pew can also be the cause for Christians not to engage in personal soul winning. Sometimes I see this a lot, uh, lack of preparation. Uh, I, I talk to some of my brothers and sisters and they say, well, I just don't know what to say. Don't prepare yourself. I mean, this is, I was there too. The best way to learn is practicing it. And if they ask questions that you cannot answer, tell them, hold that there, I'll come back next week and I'll try to answer that question the best way to grow. So we made lack of preparation to share the gospel effectively for to others or with others. Or maybe it's a lack of fervent prayer. Um, how did your prayer, the one hour prayer time that you had look like? Did you start with uh, kind of a shopping list? Let me see what's next. Well, I need to finish the list. Is it this way, or is it, you know, a, you know, fervent, real cry from the soul, saying, "Lord, this this neighbor of mine, have you trying to reach?" And you 
you have an ache, you know, something that the spirit does inside of you that it's kind of an urge. I don't know about you, but I tend to get that. Fervent prayer. But sometimes the reason some Christians make little impact in the unbelieving world is because the world sees very little in the lives of Christians that attracts them to Christ. They say, well, they do the same thing I say, I say they, they do the same things, they watch the same things, they tend the same things, they laugh at the same things, they seek the same things, they honor the same things, they praise and spend their money on the same things. They're no different from us. When you see this, no wonder the world would not want the message that we have. Paul here in this passage is going to tell us how we can be more impactful. He's going to talk to us about evangelistic wisdom. He's going to emphasize that we have a mission, that we are here for a purpose. And one of them, the most important thing, is the to comply with the Great Commission. Go and preach the gospel. Make disciples. Teach them all things. This is a command. This is not an option. But sometimes we take that as something that only missionaries are responsible of doing, maybe the preacher, and we don't take this personally. But, you know, there's another reason why I think people just don't respond uh, to gospel wisdom. So when you put it this way, your minds are <coughs> soaked with facts, but they are starving for wisdom. <clears throat> you go into the internet, you put um, any, any anything you want to put in the internet in Google, just Google it and you'll get all the information you want, whatever this, the topic might be, ancient history, sports statistics, archaeological discovery, you know, it's a, it, it, I'm using Google lately as a dictionary, where is this word? They say, where is this word? It just gives me the verse. It is so fast, so effective. But, you know, sometimes we just kind of Google it. If you Google wisdom, you probably get a different definition from what the Bible gives you. Let me give you, let me show you what the Bible says about uh, how it defines wisdom. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Understanding Him <clears throat> is, uh, is wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, it says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. In Proverbs 4, 7, it says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. is the principal thing, the main thing, get it. Go for it. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Whatever you do in life, don't just Google it. Try to understand God. And by what I read here from Paul, he understood God. And he gives us those three commands, those three words. Pray, live, and guard. Pray, live, and guard. And this afternoon, I'd like to kind of open that up a little bit. So that we can understand what evangelistic wisdom is. And Paul tells us here we must wisely walk and we need to define that. And then we must wisely redeem the time. And then we must wisely speak. Look at the first um, verse uh, in our study. We must wisely walk in verse 5. Walk in wisdom. Now if you zoom into that walk, word walk, <clears throat> you will find that it, it appears in this in a short epistle four times. Look with me in chapter 1, verse 10. That you might walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Walk worthily. In chapter 2, you see it again, verse 6. And you have therefore received Christ, as you have received Christ, the Lord so walk in him. Then you see it here in chapter 3, verse 7. In that, uh, in the which you also walk in some time when you live in them, that then he says, now you need to have a different walk. This is how you walked before. 
before you had the Lord, before you had the Holy Spirit, before you were saved, it was only natural that you behave as the flesh commanded. But now that you have the Holy Spirit, we need to be Holy Spirit guided, filled. And then you see it again in chapter 4, verse 5, walk in wisdom towards them. In other words, when you are mingling with the world, make sure you walk, you, your behavior, your conduct, is something that will not push them away from the Lord, but it will attract them to the Lord. So this word walk, I think, is interesting to understand. It's talking about our daily conduct. Literally, it refers to walking about. And figurative it describes a personal conduct. It is the sum of all that we do each day. It is the part of our lives that others seek. What do people see? I think it's in Acts chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken, where the, the Christians were called Christians for the first time. Before then, it was those of the way. But people, the, the, the unbelievers, started calling them Christians. Now that's an honor. When an unbeliever can say, oh, you, you must be a Christian. One of those who thinks like Christ, speaks like Christ, behaves like Christ, makes choices like Christ, with you're one of those. And an unbeliever calls you Christian and not yourself, you can say you've got something going. And what Paul is saying here, let, let your life speak for itself. Now, of course, a good behavior is not enough to bring somebody to understand their need for the gospel. We need to not only live, we need to share the message. But when he talks about walking or walking about, it is talking about uh, you know, our personal conduct, the sum of all that we do each day. It is the part of our life that others see. Brother Timothy, Timothy read from the book of uh, Philippians, I think it was, and we see another word there, conversation. Now, when we talk about conversation, it's what we speak. But when Paul is talking about living your conversation, he's talking about what you communicate with the, thing, the things that you do, how you behave. Now, how many of you know that what you, what you do communicates a message? What can people see? And a walk begins when we get out of bed, right? What we do then is we have to choose. We have to choose our clothing. We have to choose whether we're going to have a Bible time, a Bible time, a Bible study and prayer or the lack of it. We're going to, uh, we, we will show the attitude at the breakfast table. How do you look when you get up in the morning and you sit for, for breakfast? My wife says, until I have my coffee two hours later, then I start being a person. <laughs> Before that, she's like, <clears throat> yeah, she's not a person. She's more, she looks more like a zombie. She needs her to wake up juice, as they call it in the States. The attitude. A lot of people get up grumpy. Did you know, did you, did you see that ever in somebody? They get up and they're like, <laughs> did I do something? Did you have a, a, a nightmare? What happened? So the people that, you know, immediately as they get up, uh, there's a problem. Or maybe uh, our punctuality to school or work, our time on social media. Did you know that most of the people just get up and automatically reach out for the phone and go to bed, leaving the phone? And between getting up and going to bed, it's the phone all day or the computer. It, when we talk about our walk, it also speaks about uh, our honesty and dishonesty, our views, the, our viewing habits, our choices of language, our prayer before we eat lunch or lack of prayer, our obedience or disobedience to rules and laws, our respect or disobedience of others. The way you live your life is your walk. <clears throat> But why would Paul ask us to walk this way? Notice that what we have here is because we need the, the time. We don't know how long we have. We live most of the time like we had a thousand more years to go. Just the other day, I think I mentioned it this morning, that normally every year we need to do the church uh, accounts. I need to take it over to an administrator. I go to Paco, and Paco's always there. And I say, Paco, 
Here I am again. Last year and the year before. I tried to win the street several times. I'm giving him tracks. He never, you know, it's too busy. Just smoking away. But this year, last, uh, this year when I went to see Paco, the lady, the secretary, said <coughs> he's not with us anymore. He's gone. I said, what do you mean? Yeah, Paco died last August. A heart attack. The thing is that a few months before that, in January, when I went to take the the, the finance of the paper, the, the receipts and everything, he looked kind of pale, he looked gray, and his hair he kind of changed from one year to the other. He wasn't looking too good. And I had this urge, like, I had this, this question. I really want to sit down and say, hey, Rick, you know, give me five good minutes of your attention. I didn't have that time. So later on, when I went back and Papa was not around, I felt burdened. I said, did I use my time wisely? Did I just go over there and just dump the, the, the receipts and all the accounting and just say, hey, I'll be back in a month, make it sense, make uh, some sense out of all this. Hopefully I can make some sense when I, I come before the church, when I have to present the numbers. I have to confess that I've been to his office ready to just dump this and not really concerned about his soul. And that bothers me. I remember years ago, back working back at the United States Air Base, I was, you know, I was geared into witnessing. I was really every day. I, my goal was to corner somebody and uh, really save ten people uh, every day. Was, you know, that was, there was this seal. I wanted to do this, but at one time, this man that used to come to the office to me to ask for, you know, for supplies and so on, I never witnessed him. And he always seemed very open, but I, I realized I never witnessed him when he passed away, another heart attack. My mind was bombarded with questions. When did, did I ever take the chance to reach this person with the gospel? And in that case, I didn't. And I asked the Lord, Lord, am I going to have to give account for that? You know, people are serving in a walk. We might like to think uh, that they don't notice us when we're doing wrong, and hopefully they notice us when we're doing right. But people notice our walk. In Proverbs 20, 11 says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. We communicate with what we do every day. And God challenges us to walk in wisdom towards them that are without. That means those who are out of Christ. We have a message to communicate. And it needs to be a, a message not just spoken, but a living testimony of the change that Christ has done in our life. Mm -hmm. We cannot back <laughs> up our spoken testimony with a living testimony. People will say, uh, if it doesn't work for you, why should it work for me? We have people around us who are without. Your neighbors, people on the bus, on the train, classmates, workmates, those in the shopping center. One of my buddies, one of my uh, spiritual mentors, years ago when I was doing my first steps in my Christian walk, I had three very influential Christians in my life. I got saved through an, uh, an American guy called Johnny Carrillo. He was Puerto Rican, a tremendous soul winner. He showed me the practical way of living my Christianity. I had another guy called Steve Pico who showed me how to share the gospel effectively and faithfully every day. His, his lifestyle was criticized by those around him because he kept on talking about that Jesus. And of course I picked up on the unbelievers and, uh, and, uh, and I said, yeah, he's kind of his uniform was spotless. I think he ironed his uh, uniform uh, uh, three times a night. I don't know. He was, it, was, it was so well ironed, and he had only one fault. In his side pocket, he had a little New Testament, one of those Gideon New Testaments. And I, every time he approached me in the, in the squadron, we would, we would go from one place to another to get paperwork and so on. Every time I saw Steve, he was always looking at me with this ridiculous evangelistic smile. 
Ray would throw me questions, and I'd say, oh, he'd got me again. And he'd be very kind. I don't know why I had this attitude, but you know, he'd be very kind and helpful. Helpful. When nobody else wanted to help me, he didn't think, here was Steve ready to help me without any personal interest. That bothered me. What does he want from me? My question was all the time. But he didn't want anything from me. All he wanted to do is show me the life that he had in Christ. The Christ that made that life possible. And it was Steve who led me to the Lord. There was another man, African American, who was a tremendous Bible study. He showed me how to dig into the scripture. These three men showed me three aspects of my Christian life that needed to grow. One, the practical life, the other one, my evangelistic life, and the other one, my spiritual life. They were tremendous. They were a tremendous source of influence. And, you know, I, one day when I see them in heaven, I'm going to squeeze them to death. I love those three, the three guys because they were tremendous impact. I could argue against their message, but I could not argue against their lifestyle. They would meet for lunch. And you know what they did for lunch? The worst thing you can imagine. Have lunch and listen to sermons. I had Maria, they were enjoying these sermons, just and sharing things with them. I said, what is this? What's wrong with these guys? It was that coming to me every single day that made me go back home and then think it over. That message that Steve would give me would be used by the Holy Spirit and their lifestyle that, that was always willing to share their life, waste their life on others. That bothered me and I couldn't fight it because, you know, you can fight against hate, you can fight against, you can even fight against uh, the gospel, but how do you fight love? God gives us a command here to walk in wisdom. God's wisdom must govern our attitudes, our words, our, our words, and our conduct each day. And we cannot be making excuses. You know, sometimes we hear believers say, Christians are hypocrites. They do the same questionable thing that I do. I hear them arguing and fighting just like my other neighbors. If that dishonest person is a Christian, I want nothing to do with church, etc., etc. <clears throat> but you must admit, you, we all must admit that um, we have failed the Lord in many ways. Sometimes we use our tongue very lightly. Our attitudes just are not what they're supposed to. We just rage in anger sometimes. We we don't even care the way we dress. We. Uh, with, uh, honesty is just not that uh, does not reach the level that God uh, expects um, and, and uh, a friendly attitude just needs to be needs to be um, improved our prayer life must also be sharpened our attendance to church must be considered also <coughs> Whatever the problem is, we need to pin it down and say, Lord, here it is. This is my problem. People are seeing this. This is what I communicate. This is my conversation. This is what I'm communicating to others. So Paul, to this, it says, uh, we must walk wisely. Then we must wisely redeem the time. Look again in verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Now you need... It doesn't say how, it just says redeem the time, but it's good that we have Paul write more about it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 through 17. He writes, especially starting, yeah, verse 8 says, For we are sometimes darkness, for, that, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit, fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for what whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake. Thou that sleepest and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give you that to thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly. You know what that means? 
diligently, not as fools, but as wise. Here's the word, redeeming the time. You say, why should we be looking at time and using it wisely? Because the days are evil. How many of you agree that the times are evil? The days are evil. If you keep up with the news, you think, you know, there's so much corruption going on in every area of society that, you know, you think it's going to fall apart. We live in this world. And so we can be uh, dragged into that kind of lifestyle and waste it, or instead we can say, no, 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 hold on a second. I'm here for to do something special. God has called me not just to be, be uh, come to be this, a son of his, but also be a worker, a servant of his. I am here to serve him. And so he says, wherefore be ye, uh, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Circumspectly comes from the word, I think two words, circum, around, circle, and spectly, I think it, it pointing to uh, make an inspection. Inspect the way you live around, uh, 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 you know, around people. To work circumspectly means to live wisely, morally, and cautiously. A Christian life should be one of simplicity, soberness, faith, and praise. So why do we need to do this? Redeeming the time. Our time, folks, is limited. It only seems, when I was uh, seven years old, I wanted to be 21. How many of you felt that way? I was 14, I still hadn't grown up, and I wanted to be 18. When I was 18, I wanted to be 21. Now I'm 67, I want to be <laughs> seven again. <laughs> It, 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 it was like, oh, it's just, and some of you have been speaking about this. John says, when did the week go? We all had seven days, 24 hours. And then Tim said, wait till you're 96. Like my dad, he says that it really gets bad then. For us, weeks have become days. For the, the dad, it becomes hours. Time just flies. This morning I had one of the ladies, one of the, a secretary of the church say, Pastor, remember you told me you would be doing this, 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 and that, this, this, and that. And I said, yeah, like I didn't have anything to do. I'm going to say that to her, but I thought about it. I said, you know, this was over a month ago, and I really haven't been able to sit down and do what, she, what I told her that I'd be doing. And it's because there's so many things to do. We fall into a routine. That routine seems like it's, it starts on Monday, and then Sunday again, and then Monday again, and then Sunday again. And so the whole week just flies away. It, it, time just flies. And unless we have a, uh, you know, we, uh, we understand that we need to use the time wisely, we will probably to just let things continue that way. <clears throat> it, it is making wise and sacred use of every portion of time. A Bible commentator, Spiros Sofiatis, he was a Greek American Bible scholar, author, and ministry innovator. He put it this way By prudent and blameless conduct, gaining as much time and opportunity as possible in view of persecution and death. People might not be there tomorrow to witness to them. Does that bother you? Last week, somebody died in our block. There's over 81 families in our building, big building. One of them died. Just a month before, somebody said, oh, did you see, did you hear about so-and-so? He, he passed away in bed. Mm -hmm. And every time I hear things like that, I say, did I ever witness it? Did, did at least, did I, did I give him the track? Most of the time, I have to go back to my house, to my apartment, get back, lock myself in my office and pray and say, Lord, I didn't use my time wisely with this individual. So we must wisely walk. A walk is our daily conduct of believers observing a walk. We must wisely redeem the time. Our time is limited. We don't have <coughs> forever. We must wisely use our time. And then the, the last thing I want to speak to you about is seen in verse 6. Look with me in verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we must wisely speak. Let your speech be always 
I think uh, somebody here said one time, I am, I have a doctorate on putting my foot in my mouth. That had to say, that was kind of it. Well, can I join the club? But Paul says, listen, you're going to find pretty mean guys out there, and they're going to be throwing all their arsenal on you to make you react negatively. And he says, this is how you need to react even to the mean things I say about you. Speak, uh, let your speech always be with grace. Season with help. But what does this mean? Our speech must be always with grace. This means that our words must be gracious and kind and even and when, even when undeserved. Simply be nice. Be nice, have a strategy, and be nice. This week I had a chance to experience how you get the best out of, of people, and it was not because I, I, I created it, I produced it, it was my wife again. I go to, the, to get a, a medical check and go with my wife, then we go to the, mark, the pharmacy. This is how it looks when I went to the pharmacy. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to get this, please. He goes, he brings it over here, watches it. Thank you very much. Yeah. My wife comes in, and <clears throat> five minutes later, everybody's talking to her. Everybody's giggling. Everybody just, you know, kind of, it's like, a, I said, how does she do that? She has a way, you know. I said, you know, every, every time I go with you, I'm making friends. When I go home by myself, I make enemies. Oh, no, I don't make enemies. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, how does she do it? I go in to pick her up the other day. There's a, a, a man that lives there, and he's hugging my wife. You know, like this. He, this is the first person. And then he goes to me and says, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and I said, how do you do that? And he says, this. I, my speech is always with grace, but how come it's not with me? Not you with others? No, no, no. I'm only kidding. <laughs> always with grace, season with so bringing the, you know, showing this, this love and concern, just being nice to people, even when they're not nice to you. This is hard for me. But when I go around with, to, with Marisa, she teaches me lessons on this every single day. It's a, I think it's a divine enabling, I don't know. And we need that. We need to be able to be, you know, loving and tender and compassionate as we speak to unbelievers of our Christ, depending on the Holy Spirit's help. We need that. We need that desperately. We need to be nice. So our speech must always be with grace. Then we have this word season. Paul expands this in Ephesians 4. In chapter 4, verses 29 through 32, it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Oh, okay, it gives us a clue there. That it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and, wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice, and be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There it is. <clears throat> the season to season our words with salt. Somebody put it this way: it's just uh, use words that taste nice. I think this is something, the way my grand, grandson would describe it. Just be nice. You're not being nice. Be nice. Be tactful. Be kind. Use tact. Even, even if it's so, how many of you are good throwing something good at somebody who is throwing something bad at you? You're waiting on the traffic light, and then it, it, it turns to green. Two seconds later, you have somebody in the back going, ar, 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 and going you know, doing all kinds of signs. And I feel like going to them. <laughs> Let me get my baseball bat. I feel like doing some sports with somebody's head. That's Sammy. That's the old nature in me. Anybody there? I don't know. So I read that and said, flesh, heal. I was back at Many, many years ago, many years ago, back at the, at the base, I think it was a, probably about a year or two in the Lord. 
And uh, the, the office where I worked was about this size. You had uh, four departments, so it was kind of divided, and people would walk in and go to different departments. And one day, um, Johnny Carrillo, the guy that led me to the Lord, walks in and he, and he hears this, Sammy is witnessing to this buddy what I call, and he said, and he went like this, and I said, what? He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm witnessing. He says, yeah, I can see that. But before he called me, he, from the distance, he said, heal flesh. <laughs> it was like, oh boy, you know, I'm, I'm behaving more like an animal. So I went to him and said, what, what are you, what are you, what's going on? He says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm witnessing. No, you were arguing. Tell me, that's not the way you do it. And he took me by the side and showed me that, <coughs> that you know, how Christ did it. And I saw, I said, you know, I was more ready to win a fight, win an argument, than winning him to Christ. I just wanted to be right. and wanted him to recognize him. <coughs> Be nice. Heal the flesh and let the new nature, the spirit nature, the Holy Spirit's nature come out. That's what we need to show people. Be sure to give a, a good response. I think First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 gives us the order that we need to, um, how we need to be prepared. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts. What does that mean? Sanctify the Lord in your heart. So that, it, it all starts there. That's not put in order. Nothing else will work. Make sure that he is center stage in your own heart. That he is ruling. Give him the place that belongs only to him. And then he says, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope, of the hope that is in you with meekness of fear, having a good conscience that Whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that, that falsely accuse your good conversation, that your good behavior in Christ. Sanctify yourself. Be always ready to give an answer. Be reasonable when you give an answer. Make sure you make a good defense. But notice it says the attitude must be meekness and fear. You need to do it with respect. What I was doing that day with that buddy of mine and the workmate, it wasn't witnessing, or should I say it, I was witnessing, but I wasn't witnessing the gospel. I just wanted to have my own way. You need to also think that when you witness to people, everybody's unique, is, is different. You know, when Paul preached to the Jews, he would use a different approach than when he witness to the Gentiles. When he went to Athens, for example, he looked around to see the environment and he used the environment as an opening to bring in the message. He used the culture. You know, if you're witnessing to a Mormon, a Catholic, a Jehovah's Witness, no matter what it is, you need to understand where you have to approach them. I see the same thing with different cultures. It's not the same to preach to a German person than it is to a Latino. I mean, the message is the same, but you have a different approach. We need to be wise in the way we use our time. We need to also uh, be wise in the way we walk. And we need to be wise in the way we speak. Our speech must always be with grace. Our speech must always be seasoned. And our speech must always be perceptive understanding what we have in front of us. I don't know about you, but this passage has touched my heart. Every, every passage of this book uh, has been just, you know, holding in, just gripping me and saying, Sammy, yeah, you've gone far, but not far enough. There's a lot of improvement needed in this man here. How many of you can say the same thing? We need to take this to heart. We need to make sure that we pray for opportunities to share the gospel, for open doors, open mouths, that we might share a clear message. We might pray also for 
boldness so that we could uh, take advantage of every situation, pray, live your life in the light of the gospel, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, be the most and make the most of every opportunity and guard your speech. Somebody said one time <clears throat> then that what we say uh, what we say is sometimes like yeah you know, when we say something wrong and try to take it back it's like throwing uh, a ton of leaflets uh, from an airplane that is scattered around and then try to pick up uh, the, those leaflets again. It's impossible. It spreads out. We need to watch out. Our words can harm our testimony. And it can also push people away from Christ. We have a mission. How are you doing it? How are we as a church doing it? You need to answer that question. Let's all stand and have a little prayer. <coughs> Father, we see Paul writing this epistle from prison. But we don't see him sad because of the circumstances he is in. We don't see him fearful because of the conditions that he's in. In fact, he's praying, he's asking others to pray for him that the Lord might open more doors, not necessarily the prison doors, but and the, uh, doors of opportunity, and he did. He, we have Onesimus, we have others who came to Christ because of his testimony in prison. We have uh, some guards that it seemed like they also made a profession of Christ because of Paul being ready to share the gospel with them. His, me, him being in prison did not make him bitter, did not, did not make him aggressive. He did not feel like he was being treated unfairly. In fact, as Paul read today, uh, uh, Tim read today, he considered that a privilege because it meant an opportunity to reach people and it encouraged people outside to be more uh, ready to share the gospel. Many things are going on while he's in prison. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be able to, a uh, heart, we'll be able to listen to that and, 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 and be ready to do the same thing. Changes, Lord. Changes. Let us not conform to this world and to this world's thinking. May our behavior be one that people can see truly that Christ liveth in us so that when we share the gospel, they'll be more ready to listen. We pray for open doors, doors of opportunity, there are many people around us, Lord, that need to hear the message of salvation. We pray, Lord, that you will help us prepare ourselves better to give it a proper answer, a proper defense of what we believe. That with the message that we share will be a hopeful one. Even though we have to talk about sin and repentance, that we should we say it in a way that will make people hopeful, that will make people look towards Christ for the solution. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us not scare away from opportunities, but that we walk into the opportunities with, the, with boldness. Change us, Father, so that we can be used by you to change the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.